A few weeks ago, I shared a video showing how to use the declarative HTTP client support that's new in Spring Framework 6. But did you know that Spring 6 also includes similar support for declarative RSocket clients? In this video, I'm going to show how to create declarative RSocket clients with Spring 6. And because I recognize that you may not have had a chance to work with RSocket yet, I also show how to create the server-side components in RSocket. So with no further delay, let's get started. First off, we're going to create a brand new project. It's a brand new Spring Boot project. And we're going to use Spring Boot 3.0 so that we get Spring 6 in there. Uh, the group ID is fine as Habuma. Instead of the artifact ID being demo, we're going to have a responder. Now we do need a server side for this. So we, we do need a responder, somebody who's going to respond to the requests that are sent from the requester. So we're going to create one called responder. We're going to use RSocket and Spring Boot Dev Tools, which are a couple of dependencies I've used previously on examples like this. And we're going to generate into this folder I've already created called RSocket. And we're going to wait for it to generate. Okay, there it is. It's already there. All right. Now, as I open it up, I'm pretty sure VS Code's Java extension is going to realize that this is a Java app, and it'll start doing some some stuff to make that available as a Java project under these the Java projects thing down here. So it's probably good to wait until it's finished with that. All right, we're all, we're all good. Now, because this is an RSocket responder, we're going to have to have it handle requests. Now in Spring MVC or in Spring Webflux, requests are handled with controllers and it's no different in RSocket. We're going to create a controller. We're going to call it Hello Controller because we're going to start off with a simple Hello World example. And we're going to annotate it as a controller. The very same annotation that we used for Spring MVC if we were building a web app or even with potentially with Spring Web Flex. All right, as you can see here, it, we're getting a suggestion already. We're being given a suggestion from GitHub Copilot, and GitHub Copilot is offering us a Hello World example. Now, I'll go ahead and keep that, but I'm going to change it a little bit. Instead of returning a string, I'm going to return a mono of type string because this is reactive after all. And of course, I can't just simply return the string there. I have to return just. I have to create a mono from that string. But so far, so good. And the only other thing we need to do really in this controller is we need to create a mapping for it. And I don't really like Copilot's suggestion on that. It's essentially suggesting what I just did. But uh, we're going to go ahead and use message mapping. Now message mapping is kind of like git mapping or request mapping or things like that, but instead of handling an HTTP request, this is handling a message. And this is used in a lot of different places inside Spring, whether you're using message-driven beans or, or R, in this case, RSocket. So we're going to use message mapping, and the suggestion that Copilot's giving here is exactly what I would have done anyway, and that is we're going to create a message mapping for a destination called hello. So whenever a RSocket request is sent to the destination hello, then this method is going to get the job. Now we're almost done actually with the server side of this. We do need to come over here to application properties and it's good good practice to say spring.rsocket.server.port is 7000. And that's the port that it's going to listen on by default. And that's also the, 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 the port that it's going, the client is going to send requests to. And that's fine. That's good. We've already set that. We don't need to mess with that again. We're good to go. Now let's create the client side. To create the client side, we're going to create a brand new Spring Boot project, just like we did before. But in this case, we're going to call it Requester. We're going to use the same dependencies. We're going to save it into the same folder. And as soon as I open this up and go in here to source Java and open this, this file up, well, I would hope that VS Code's Java extension would realize this is a Java project and do all the right things. But as you can see from this little light bulb right here, it's really not. So one of the things I've learned to do is just simply do a clean workspace. And that sort of tends to work things out. So let me do that. All right, 
good stuff. We see the requester, we see the responder, we're all good to go. In fact, our little light bulb thing has gone away in the application. All right, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create an interface. So I'm gonna create a new file. We're gonna call it hello client.java. And automatically it's, it, well, I mean, I guess I did have a drop down there, but it's gonna create a class. I'm gonna change that to an interface. And I need to declare a hello method. And the best way to do that probably is, well, not with a public, but with a mono string hello. In fact, that's exactly what I wanted it to do, is it's going to be a mono string hello method. Now, I need to do one thing here. I need to, re to annotate this with our socket exchange. So, our socket exchange. And then I need to tell it the destination we're going to, or more accurately, it's a pattern of the destination we're going to go to, because we could put the equivalent of Spring and VC or Spring Web Flux path variables, we could put those in this pattern as well and specify a destination. But for our purposes, we just need hello. And that's it. We've just defined our client interface. As far as the interface is concerned, we're done. But we also need to define a couple of beans to make this work. If you've watched my other videos that I've produced recently on creating declarative HTTP clients, the, the what we have to do here is very similar. We have to declare a bean of type rsocket service proxy factory. And we'll call it ahead and call it rsocket service proxy factory. And we'll for the most part ignore the things that the Copilot is giving us because it's giving us some bad some bad recommendations here things we don't want but in whoops didn't mean to accept that but instead we're going to take as an argument in our socket requester dot builder and we're going to call that one requester builder and then what we're going to do is when in, when we return from this we're not going to do that that's that's a horrible thing that's not exactly what I wanted to do uh, where's my semicolon or my curly brace there we go. I need to return instead of all the stuff it's going to recommend. We're going to try our best to ignore that because it tends to be a little distracting. We're going to say our socket requester, we're going to create one of those, equal requester builder dot, and we want this to be TCP, not, uh, our, not WebSocket or anything like that, but TCP localhost 7000. Now that is a good recommendation from Copilot, so we'll stick with that. And the last thing we need to do is we need to say our socket service proxy factory dot oops or all circuit our socket service proxy factory dot builder oops it, I wish it would have completed that for me that would have been handy dot builder and we're going to pass in our requester there we go all right oh yes got got the call build always tend to forget that. Okay, there we go. So we've just declared at our socket service proxy factory. Now we need to, just like we did with the declarative HTTP clients, we need to declare our actual client bean. And in this case, the client bean is going to be from our hello client interface. So that much is right. The name of it's going to be right. In fact, I'm looking at this and there's only a couple things I would change about it. So I'm going to go ahead and accept everything that Copilot's telling me. The only thing I really want to change here is the create method should be create client. But aside from that, I think it's all good. I think we're all good. And now we've both declared the client as an interface. We've created a proxy factory, an RSocket service proxy factory bean. And from that bean, with that bean, we are with that factory, we have created a client bean. Now we're ready to use it. So the easiest way to use it is I found for demo purposes anyway, is to create an application runner. And no, if you're if, if you're not familiar with application runner, uh, application runner is one of two interfaces that Spring Boot offers, command line runner being the other one, that have a single run method in them. And these run methods on these application runners and command line runners, they get invoked before pretty much anything in the application happens, but after the application context has been created. So what that means is, in this case, by the time our application runner gets invoked, 
all the beans, all the hello, more specifically, most importantly, the hello client will have already been created and we're ready to use it. We just need to inject it in here so that we'll have a, a reference to it. So hello client, and we'll call it, how about we call it client? And then I need to create the actual application runner. So return args. Now it take it's a single uh, run method that takes a an arguments as its as its argument, and I'm not going to use the arguments at all. So having what we have here is just fine. I, I really wish it didn't do all the stuff it's offering right now with Copilot, but I guess that's okay. That's a fine start. I would just do something slightly different. Um, this will work. I, I guess I could keep this. This this will work. Um, I tend to not like to do things like that in my subscribe. I like to instead have a do on next. I mean, it's six of one, half dozen of the other, honestly. But I'm going to just go ahead and do this. That way it's a little bit different from the subscription on it. And I'm going to sys out the greeting and do that. Great. Now we're ready to start this. To run, we're going to kick over to the Spring Boot dashboard. We're going to see all of our projects in here. And we're going to kick off the responder first. We're going to make it have it running. It should be listening on port 7000 on localhost in the background. And as you can see, that's what it says here. Netty RSocket started on port 7000. So we're good with that. Now time for the requester. So I'm going to kick that off. And it's going to run. And you're going to see some logs. You're going to see an error in there. The error actually doesn't really mean much. It's it's a, complaining a little bit about the fact that I'm running on a Mac M1 and there's a native library that Netty's having trouble with. Ignore that. Uh, but what we did not see, unfortunately, what we did not see is our greeting. Why, why didn't this work? And the answer to th that question is really simple. It, it kind of did work. Uh, but the main thread that this application runner is running in, the main thread died before we got a response back because this is all asynchronous, working with monos. And um, so the main thread died before we got our response back and got a chance to sys out it. So to, to fix that, here's a little trick I've learned. There's a couple things I've, I've tried in the past. I mean, I've done threads where I keep the thread alive for some number of seconds, but a much easier approach I've found is to say sys out. Um, press enter to quit just to kind of remind me that we need to do that and then sys sys oops not sys sys dumb dot in dot read and what that's going to do is it's going to hold the 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 main thread hostage until somebody presses enter that's going to give the mono a chance to get an answer back so let's give it another shot And look, it ran. Now we see the press enter to quit, but we also see greeting, hello world. Let me bump up the font there just so you're not squinting too much. But there it is, greeting, hello world. It worked, fine, fantastic. Now, let's talk about what we just did though. After we bump the font back down a little bit. Let's talk about what we just did. We created an RSocket server using a controller that handles requests to the hello destination and responds with a mono of a mono with a string in it called hello world. On the client side, we declared a client that when called this when you call this hello method sends a request to the server and the server responds with that mono of string and then we can use this hello method however we want in our application. In our example, we're just using it inside of the application runner, but it could be used anywhere in the example perhaps in a service class or even in a controller, a, a RSocket controller or an HTTP controller of some sort. I keep stressing the point though that we're sending requests and we're getting back a response. That is the RSocket request response model. RSocket has other models as well. Request response is one of just a handful of those. The other ones are request stream, fire and forget, and channel. Request response is what we see here, but the differences between those is largely based on the cardinality of what's being sent and what's being responded with. So we're sending a request, cardinality of one, one request. We're receiving a response in a mono, cardinality of one again. So it's request response. 
it's a one request for one response scenario. So that's request response. If we wanted to do request stream, all we'd have to do instead of returning a mono of string is we'd re or mono of any object for that matter, we'd return a flux of that object. So let's take a look at that. And to do that, I'm going to come back over to my controller. I'm going to declare another method in here. We'll call it message mapping and we'll give it a name counter that's the destination it's going to go to and you're going to see some suggestions here that I do not care for so we're going to change those we're going to re we're going to return a flux and it says it's making a reasonable suggestion here but I'm going to change it slightly instead of returning a flux of integer I am going to return a flux of string and instead of doing a range I'm just going to do a wide open flux dot interval with a duration of seconds so every one second something is going to be returned I don't really need that there we go and because I'm returning a flux of string whereas flux interval returns an integer I'm going to map that to a string that is count plus i and then oops be really great if I could type there we go and there we are we have our counter handler method in our controller and that's it we took that interval which is going to count every one second from now to eternity and it's going to re it's going to map that whatever it, that count is to a string that is the string count colon space and then whatever the number is great that's the server side let's come over to our client side which by the way I'm not entirely uh, sure, but we should double check. I believe, in fact, I kind of see it right here. Uh, by saving that, our and by having dev tools in place, that restarted for us already. So we don't re need to restart the server. It's already restarted and it's ready to handle requests to the counter. But because this is a flux and not a mono, this is not a request response. It is a request stream. It's returning a stream of things. And every one second, it'll return something. On the client side, we just need to do this again. We say our socket exchange counter, and we want to return a flux for counter. And that's it. Now, this is where the creating that proxy factory as a separate bean really shines because I only had to declare this once. And in fact, on this client, I only had to declare it once. But now the client has both of these operations in it, and I can start using those. And so let's do that. Let's go over to our application, let's go to the application runner, and after it has said hello, then we're going to say something like this. I have this little extra in here, I need to take that out. Uh, the, we're going to say client.counter.do on, that's going to return that flux, we're going to say do on next. We're going to take that, whatever that counter is, and we're going to sys out it. And here it's suggesting counter plus C. That's that's kind of crazy because the response is going to have counter colon in it as well. And therefore it would be outputting counter colon, counter colon, and then whatever the number is. But rather than you know ditch that entirely, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this. I'm going to put a dash in front of it. That way it kind of stands out a little bit. And of course the last thing we need to do because this is a flux is we need to call subscribe on it. and put a semicolon. All right, so now let's go back. Our responder should already be running. Our requester never died because we forgot to hit enter, so it did restart. I guess I should kill it just to make sure because I don't know where we are on that. Oh, you can see, I guess it did restart. DevTools kind of kicked it off for me, but that's okay. We'll go ahead and kick it again, and there it is. We see our greeting hello world, and we see that every one second, we're getting an object. We're getting a number back, a count and a number back. So this is a request stream. We're sending one request, but we're getting multiple responses back. So therefore, it's a request stream. Well, what about fire and forget? Well, fire and forget's just as simple. Uh, the big difference is, in the case of fire and forget, and we'll go ahead and stop that just so I'm not confused the next time around. The big difference with fire and forget is that instead of returning a 
stream of responses or a mono with one response, it just can return a mono of nothing. So let's see how that works. We'll call this one, because I don't feel terribly creative enough, we're gonna call this one alert. We're gonna send, it's gonna, we're gonna send from the client an alert message to this. Now I don't like any of the ex suggestions that Copilot's giving me here, but I am gonna return, I guess I do agree with this part, I'm gonna return a mono avoid, which means I don't care. I don't really care what it's sending me. I just want to be able to get it and, and handle that. So, how am I gonna get it? Well, I'm gonna send it from the client as a string. So that's a fine choice right there, a, a, a mono of type string. And I'm just gonna simply say, oops, alert dot do on next and it's going to take whatever that message is from the alert and do something with it. I'm going to sys out it just to keep it simple. Sys out and got an alert and we'll say M so that's fine and the one thing we do need to do because if we don't it's not going to work we need to subscribe to that mono. Finally just because the method needs to return something we have to return a mono of empty because the method still needs to return a void even if the client doesn't care what that is. We do still need to return a mono. It's just a mono that's empty. All right. Now the server probably, or the responder probably just restarted. On the client side, we'll go ahead and toss that in here as well. And it's, again, it's, it's very much the same as we've seen before. But it's going to be a mono of string that we're sending in, and it's a mono of void that we're getting back. To make that call, we're going to come over to our application, and after we've done our counts, I'm going to say client the alert, and instead of saying hello world, maybe we'll do something more awesome. We'll say red alert, and of course, because again it is returning a mono, we do need to subscribe to it. All right, let's see if it works. Kick off the requester again. And you see that we have our greeting of hello world. We see that we have a count. Oops, we have a count. It's up to seven or eight now. But we don't see anything for the alert. And the reason for that is, is because again, on the client, we didn't return anything. The client didn't care. It's fire and forget. But the responder should have cared. And in fact, it did. You see that it sis outed, got an alert, red alert. It worked. The client sent it, it's a red alert, and the server logged it. Well, finally, what about channel? Let's bump our font back down so we can work with this again. And go ahead and hit enter here so that we can we can leave this. Oops, should probably hit enter in the, re in the re requester. There we go. Okay, so what about the channel communication style? Well, the channel communication style, whereas request response is one to one and request stream is one to many, and fire and forget is one to nothing. Channel is a communication style where both sides are talking back to each other. One sending something, one sending something back constantly. It's a constant communication, a constant back and forth between the requester and the responder. Therefore, it's a many to many. And when we're talking minis, when we're talking about reactive or project reactor, a mini is represented by a flux. So in our controller, we're going to create a one more message mapping and we're going to call this one channel because I don't feel terribly uh, creative in my naming right now. We're just going to simply call that channel. It's going to return a flux of string. It's going to take a channel of type n. I don't really care about that. We're going to stick with that. But what I'm going to do instead here is I'm going to say, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to say return n uh, do on next. I want to oops, do on next. I want to verify that in fact we did receive something. So received. And then I want to map that to something. I'm going to map that to whatever it is, but not reply. I'm going to map it to m.2 uppercase. And then I'm going to do an on next. I'm going to basically say that here's whoops 
do on next. I'm actually going to say this is what I'm sending back, and that's it. So I'm going to take whatever is sent in as a string on the, on the flux, and, and multiple strings for that matter, because it is a stream of data. I'm going to take those strings. I'm going to log them or sys out them. I'm going to convert them to uppercase. I'm going to send them back. All right? On the client side, I want to do something very similar. I'm going to have an R socket exchange of type uh, named channel. That's the name of the destination. And certainly the, de the suggestions here that Copilot are giving me are just fine. So channel, something, some string in, some, some string flux out. We just need to kick it off. All right, for that, for that I'm going to do something very special here. I'm going to, I'm going to say client channel flux just and this flux just is fine, except that I kind of want it, I want to do something more with it than just that. So I'm going to say flux just, I'm going to assign that to a flux of type string. Oops, oops if I could type. Uh, I'm going to call it fruit flux. And I'm going to return an apple, a banana, a cherry, a date, and I don't know what would go here, eggplant. That's fine. It's not really a fruit, but it'll it'll serve our purposes. Okay. Now that I have that fruit flux, I'm going to send the fruit flux in. I'm going to do on next. I'm going to get that fruit. I'm going to log it, and then I'm going to subscribe to it. Now, if I did this, you're going to see the response come back really quick because it's going to send apple, banana, cherry, date, eggplant really fast, and you're going to see the response come back really fast, and it's going to be at least visually indistinguishable from a situation where you might send a list or some other collection of fruit in. I want to prove that this is a stream and so to prove that it's a stream I want to make this flux do something a little bit. I'm going to have a delay and so that it's only going to send a fruit every 5,000 milliseconds or every five seconds more accurately. Okay? Alright, let's see what happens. Now the responder should have already restarted because of DevTools, so I just have to kick off the requester. And you're going to see our greeting of hello world. You're going to see the count get started. Let's kind of zoom in on this a little bit. And you see after about five seconds we got apple. And after about nine or ten seconds we got banana. And over in the responder, we see that we're getting those, we're receiving them, and we're sending them back every one second we're getting something and we're sending back up a case. So it's a constant. We've only called it once, but we're we're calling it with a stream of fruit and we're responding with a stream of uppercase fruit names. Now that we're done with eggplant, there's no more. The stream is empty. So we're pretty much done with that. But the flux, because we had a flux, it is a many to many conversation on both the receiving side as well as on the requesting side. All right, that's it, let's recap. In this video, we started by creating a simple RSocket server or responder to handle Hello World requests in a request response communication model. Then using Spring 6's support for declarative RSocket clients, we created a simple client interface with a hello method that was annotated with RSocket exchange. To make it all work, we also declared an RSocket service proxy factory bean, which is analogous to its HTTP counterpart, HTTP Service Proxy Factory, and use that factory to create a bean implementation of the client interface. We then explored the other three RSocket communication models, Request Stream, Fire and Forget, and Channel, and saw how to develop those communication models on both the server and on the client using declarative RSocket clients. I hope that you have enjoyed this video and have learned how to work with RSocket in Spring. If so, please share this video with your colleagues and friends. And to keep up with things I'm doing, follow me on Twitter or Mastodon. And check out my books. The sixth edition of Spring in Action includes chapters on RSocket and reactive programming in Spring. Unfortunately, it doesn't cover the declarative clients as that is a newer capability than the book itself. But for something completely different, have a look at my other book, Build Talking Apps for Alexa, which talks about and shows how to create voice experiences for Amazon Alexa. 
Again, I hope you had fun watching this. Keep an eye on my Twitter or Mastodon feed as I have many more videos planned for the future. Until then, thank you for tuning in.